Now I come here tonight as an atheist who wishes to defend religion. I think that religious thinking is um, crucial for people to understand the universe. I'm a great supporter of, of science, but science is ultimately incomplete. We are still baffled by the mysteries of the universe. I don't believe in um, a transcendent God, a Jehovah, but I do believe in all gods. I'm fascinated by all religions and have been since I was a small child, probably a kind of um, function of my interest in, in archaeology. I've, um, I think that um, the religious perspective of my own 1960s generation has been very underestimated. I've, I've written a very long piece for uh, Orion, the scholarly journal, on that question called Cults in Cosmic Consciousness. Um, the religious, all about the religious vision of the 1960s, which I think has been uh, too much stereotyped as a purely political um, movement. And there was this other thing, this, this looking for meaning in the meaning of life. So let me um, give a little bit of background about my own assumptions, my own experiences. I'm the product of an Italian immigrant family in upstate New York. My mother and all four of my grandparents were born in Italy. They came over to upstate New York to work in the Endicott Johnson shoe factory, so it was a working class family. The um, religiosity of the women was very pronounced. The men were skeptics. Right? The men uh, hated the priests never went to church, it would drag there okay, on Christmas and Easter and sat there very glum. And it's a kind of carryover from the disrespect for priests in general in, um, in, in France and, and um, you know, in, in, in the Mediterranean uh, countries where the, where the priests could be corrupt and gay and, and everything else and so on. There was a lot, a lot of, um, you know, the, the priesthood or the convent, it was a good career move for, for, you know, for a very long time. It's one of the things that Martin Luther was, you know, was originally rebelling against. But the um, uh, uh, the, the, the images of my baptismal church, St. Anthony uh, of Padua, in Endicott, New York, uh, were overwhelming to me. The first artworks I ever saw were those uh, polychrome statues of the saints, the gorgeous stained glass windows. Um, and so I, I just was absorbed with the beauty of these images. And Christianity really didn't make a dent on me. I mean, Christianity, I was surrounded with Christianity for my entire young youth, you know, and it didn't didn't absorb, I, not, I don't have anything, n nothing in me ever responded to the story of, of Jesus and, um, and, and his sacrifice and his crucifixion. I don't know what it was. When I stand in front of the Stations of the Cross, I would be looking at the Roman soldiers. I thought that the Roman soldiers looked fabulous in those outfits, and I, requ <laughs> I requested to be a Roman soldier, and I was age seven for Halloween. My parents constructed the Roman soldier costume and, and so on, right? And I just could never, I, I longed for assertion and for, for you know, some place in the world. I, didn't, I just never understood the, that, that story, okay, which is, has moved, of course, billions in, in, in the last 2,000 years of, of, of Jesus and his turning the other cheek. Uh, um, no, no. I, I, I come from Italian tradition, of, you know, which is closer to the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, tradition. I just never understood that. I never understood the, you know, the, the stumbling and the, and the, you know, all, all of that. I, again, I identified with what I realized was the, was the pagan element in Roman Catholicism. My, um, you know, my, my spirit really went out to St. Michael the Archangel in, in his battle arm, and he remains you know, my, my favorite saint. It was late, almost late, later in college that I realized how often the uh, Christian saints were survivals, actually, of, of pagan gods who just simply were renamed. The most famous example of that being, of course, San Gennaro of Naples, uh, who was uh, Janus, the, the Genuarius, the, um, one, one of the Roman gods, just renamed and, and, and sort of recycled and, and absorbed into, into Roman Catholicism. And the, you know, for, my, for the women of, of uh, the Italian culture, the cult of Mary was extremely strong, with a tremendous identification with, with Mary. And I, re and I re remember with awe the uh, nighttime litanies of the Blessed Virgin Mary, where you, which were, to, you know, as far as I'm concerned, a kind of survival. Of, of pagan rituals of the great goddess of, you know, of antiquity, because you'd have the, you know, the priests singing out these beautiful poetic phrases, you know, Mary, you know, tower of ivory, you know, vessel of gold, all these like, amazing images. And then, and then the laity saying, pray for us, pray for us. It's like this rumbling kind of litany, really kind of uncanny, that kind of nighttime feeling. All women, all women, okay, in the, in the congregation. And then the grottos, 
what was this grotto thing? The Italians have this thing for grottoes. They'll have, you know, they'll have statues of saints in the grotto and light candles. So it was clearly a survival of some kind of ancient earth cult, okay, which has is, which is, you know, been cloaked under Catholicism. I think really Italians have never really been converted uh, to, to Christianity. <laughs> So at any rate, um, uh, I, I, then when my parents moved on to a small farming town of Oxford and then eventually to Syracuse, I had a tremendous culture clash with, with, with the, the Protestants of upstate New York, feeling very, very alien. It's a sort of Italian Catholic, very emotional, empathic view of religion compared to um, the, the Protestant view, which is much more Bible-centered, much more text-oriented, uh, the, the churches typically all white with very, very, with no decorations, no statues, you know, plain windows. Uh, and, and, so, and so I, I began to encounter, which I really did very heavily in Syracuse, the, the moralism in um, mainstream Catholicism. When I got to Syracuse, uh, the Catholicism there was more Irish, you know, filled with guilt and pain and, the, and this darkness and then all, you know, all this stuff you know, going on. I, I didn't understand that at all. Uh, and, then, uh, and then Syracuse was ruled by the Presbyterian and Episcopalian establishment, which ran the business culture and the country clubs and so on. So I felt very much alien as, a, as an Italian Catholic in that environment. And there are all kinds of other you know, stories too about um, the, you know, the, the argument I had with a, a, a non-religious education class. I, I asked her what, what I thought was a perfectly civil tone, but who knows. Um, it, you know, if God is all forgiving, is it possible that he will someday forgive Satan? Which seems to me a highly intelligent question for, you know, for a 16 year old, you know, suppose. The nun turned beet red. She was Irish Catholic. I turned beet red okay, and began screaming at me. This was in church. That we, we were all in the pews in the back of the church. I said, this is it. This is it. Okay, if I can't get any discourse, you know, going with the, with the, you know, with the religious establishment. I was very drawn toward Hollywood in that period. The Legion of Decency was still was still uh, operating, and every week would be posted in the church foyer a list of the movies playing in town in Syracuse. The one, a classified, okay, A, you know, every, every, all Catholics may see this movie, it's fine. Okay, B, only adult Catholics may see this movie, okay, no children, okay, and then C was condemned. Okay, condemned with no Catholics under pain, pain of sin should see this moment. Well, there was only one on that on that list, and I will remember it like I burned in hellfire, baby doll. Okay? And this was a, a Tennessee Williams script, a very decadent film actually. I, it took me 40 years before I saw that film. Finally, it surfaced on cable TV. Uh, I a baby doll. What could that be? What could it be? Well, it really was pushing the limits. It was about it was about uh, you know a kind of uh, a kind of pedophilia. There was a you know kind of provocative display on Broadway of Carol Baker and um, sucking her thumb in a baby doll nighty. Even today, it would kind of you know, raise, uh, raise eyebrows. But I realized at that moment in the church foyer that I was identifying with Hollywood, that Hollywood was my true religion. Um, and, and typify, you know, to me, you know, the ultimate goddess of that period was, was Elizabeth Taylor. And my, one of my transcendent moments of, 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 of my adolescence was when she won the Oscar for Butterfield A, for playing the high class hooker, okay, Manhattan hooker. Um, I still think she is fascinating fabulous in that movie, and I review her as my Babylonian goddess, okay, to this moment. All right, but nevertheless, okay, nevertheless, okay, I, was, I have always taken religion extremely seriously, and I, when I got to college in the, in the mid-1960s, I was very interested in the Buddhism that, came, that was uh, coming to us from the beat generation of the 1950s, and also the, the new interest in Hinduism that we, it was kind of being imported via, via England. I mean, that was the period when the Beatles went off you know, to India and had the thing with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. So it's when Brian Jones was experimenting with the sitar you know, in Rolling Stone songs and, and so on and so forth. And I devoured all kinds of books on this subject. Um, Alan Watts' books in particular were of great interest to me, in which he was comparing Western and Asian ways of perceiving the world. I, I, I thought that that was um, one of the most amazing expansions of thinking of my generation was this, was this tilt toward Hinduism. So, t so it's been a, a matter of great um, distress to me that that has vanished. That, that by the 1980s, and I've been teaching now for 38 years, by the 1980s it was gone. Okay, that my students no longer had any way to be directly influenced by Buddhism or Hinduism. This is why the, the basis of my, of my proposal that 
comparative religion be, be a kind of core curriculum for the world. We cannot understand any culture without understanding the religious background of, of that culture. I, I propose a way to integrate religion and the arts, uh, for everyone to be studying the sacred texts of each religion, the, the great shrines, the great artworks, to understand the, the, the you know, iconography and, and, and so on. Um, but of course, it's going to be, it would be very difficult to put that into effect. You would, have, uh, you would have resistance from both the right and the left. The left because, oh, you're teaching religion, and the right, oh, there is no religion but ours. I mean, I, I cannot see evangelical Christians in the U.S. ever accepting that Hinduism and Buddhism be taught in the, in the classroom. Neither do I see you know, Muslims in, you know, in, the, in the Near East accepting that Christianity should be taught. So I think that there will be you know, great cleavage okay, in, um, in, in mutual understanding and, you know, for, for, for a very long time. And I think that uh, the, the, the um, intellectuals in the West are underestimating the degree of danger that the West is in. A, a jihadism okay, is extremely passionate, if, if, if small, movement. Uh, I think that to, to imply that atheism and secular humanism are enough okay, to, to resist the, um, you know, the passion of, of religious faith, I think is naive. I think, we, we, I, we think we, we very, the West might very well be in the position of late Rome in being quite comfortable, quite sophisticated, and thinking that, well, we, we're, we're too educated to, um, to indulge in a religious belief. That's really for, you know, for the, oh, that's for the working class, that's for the uneducated, and so on. I think it's a terrible mistake. The, the, on, the only way secular humanism can possibly uh, withstand the power of religious belief is to, um, is to put art in its place, okay? And instead, our leftist ideologies have undermined art now for 25 years, have attacked art, okay, and tried to, from deconstruction on, um, from, from identity politics on, have tried to, um, have tried to question, okay, the, you know, the, the Western canon, have questioned the idea of greatness, of beauty, you know, all these, you know, sort of major assumptions. So I think that it's, I think we're, we're kind of facing a very serious cultural crisis. Um, and I, and I, you know, I, I have to ask you, you know, where exactly in the West is art strong? Where? Okay, where? Where? What? Where? What can you name? Okay, in the Western novel, the Western poem, the Western painting, sculpture. Where? Where is it? Okay. No, we're coming to the end. We're coming to the. We're in a very, we're in a very, very serious place where the, you know, the greatness of the West is, is is in the past. Only architecture, I think, can can still be said uh, to to be vigorous, and that unfortunately is is uh, very much a married to corporate financing. It's not really, I mean, it's somewhat an expression of the individual voice, but it's, it's very, very involved with, with, um, with economics in way that, ways that the left should feel uncomfortable with. Um, I, I, so I, I have been in, in the front lines as an educator watching the decline in uh, the religious perspective. And I first began noticing this in the 1990s when I was teaching, at that time teaching the foundation course at the University of the Arts in, um, called Arts and Civilization. It's since been abandoned, but I thought it was a very, very useful uh, two semester course. Uh, and when I would be teaching um, Michelangelo and you know, the major works of the Renaissance and so on, I remember a, a young artist you know, said to me, oh, I was so interested in your, in your class today because I've always wondered, Adam and Eve, I've always wondered about that. I always wondered what that was about. Thank you so much. You've explained it. I thought, oh no. Okay. How is it possible that a young artist could get to college and never have heard the story, you know, the foundational story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Uh, I thought, how is that possible? Well, she had very liberal parents, permissive parents, who would have been raised in a religious way and said, well, we're not going to impose all that heavy stuff on our children. Okay? And so what is the end result of this? It's a slow shift away from the, ba the basic great stories and sagas of our, of our own culture. Now, it's, it's getting more and more serious. Um, I mean, because we're going to talk about Moses tonight. Uh, I, had a, in, in my, I teach a course called The Art of Song Lyrics, and I, I, want, I actually have, I want to um, read you some of the lyrics from a very important uh, Negro spiritual of, of the 19th century, Go Down Moses, which was a coded political message of, of, of enslaved African Americans to each other. It was, they, they, they were able to sing the story of, of, you know, of the hope of liberation from bondage in church by using these stories from the Bible in ways that the, you know, the masters of the plantation completely missed the fact that the references were to themselves, that the reference to Pharaoh was to them, to the, you know, to the white slave owning establishment and so on. Now, um, I've customarily done that song in my course, and then two years ago, I was 
horrifying. I when I distributed the, the lyric to the to the class and started talking, played played it, and started talking about it, and realized this was a class of thirty, the incomprehension on people's faces. There was only a minority of people in that class who recognized the name Moses. All right. Now that we we are talking here about a cultural destruction that is so enormous, and it's happened on the left. It's happened on the left. Okay. And in the end result of it, of this, okay, this sophistication, okay, is that artists, young artists will not be able to recognize the motifs and the stories in the, some of the greatest works of art ever created. We are separating young artists from the artistic tradition of the West. We're alienating them from it. It's, like, it's a disaster, an absolute disaster. And what is in it? What have we put in its place? What do they have? Facebook, okay, Twitter, this is what they have, okay? And if you don't think that's a come down, okay, there's something wrong here. I'm glad we're in, this, in the citadel of the museum, okay? They have, they have new technology, okay? That's what absorbs them. You know, they talk to each other, they talk to each other. They're a wonderfully collaborative and humanistic generation, but they know nothing. They know nothing. And it's because of the failure of the educators, okay, over 25 years. Education has done it to itself, okay? And the end result, no more art, no more gray art. We could, will come out uh, you know, of this generation. Okay? Uh, I, don't, I, I see nothing. I, I don't see new voices arise, and there are powerful voices. And, and, I, and I believe, okay, as, again, after so many years in the classroom, that teaching religion as culture okay, really gives perspective. It gives people the long view, gives them a sense of eternity, a sense of ancient history. Right? Now, oh, the exceptions in my class okay, for this recognition of Adam and Eve, of Moses and so on, are actually the working class students in my, in, in my, in my class. And because I teach at an art school, I, I have them, working class dancers and so on, who are there under scholarship, you know, either from, from the inner city or from, from farms in, in the south and so on. The, the, the working class people in my class recognize the Bible stories because the Bible is so strong in their culture, particularly if they're from the South, and particularly if they're African American. If they're African American, they've been raised in church because the church remains a tremendous the, the unit of community in African American uh, society, uh, and that's where they, they hear great singing right? and th they're just they, they know the Bible stories. And so there's so something really wrong here, where the privileged white the upper middle class okay, has lost contact with its own heritage, right? uh, the religious heritage, when, when you have the sophisticates who are embarrassed by religion and think it's, it's kind, of, kind of old hat. I feel you know, strongly okay, that um, the, actually the Native American cultures saw the world in a very meaningful way. And I, I just, I cannot stand the sentimentalization of um, the victimology that's applied to the Native American cultures because you get these like books with these sort of like the happy tribe doing the happy thing with the, you know mixing the, the corn gruel and all these things and just absolutely to you know and there's no no sense whatever that the, the earlier phase of Indian culture the Paleo Indian uh, phase which was at the, really at the point of the end of the Ice Age as the glacier was withdrawing from you know across North America you know from upstate New York where I grew up into, in, into Canada and so on that like Celtic culture okay that it, it, it saw nature in terms of awe and fear, and you have this, this sense of the, of the power of nature, of the, you know, of the magnitude of, of, of the, the storm gods, and of, and of the, any, any rock was meaningful, any river was meaningful, and there was a sense of attunement to nature that I, is very close to the way I see things. I think it's a kind of uh, a construction from my reading of Romanticism, from my love of paintings, uh, for example, not, not just Turner, showing storms and, and you know, avalanches and, 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 and everything kind of whipped into a, kind of an energy mass, but also Caspar David Friedrich, who was a, a German a mystical painter, where you get this un, sort of sense of the uncanny coming from nature. I think that, that was part of what the 60s was seeing, right? the power of nature, that today's environmentalism, which is, you know, which is uh, tied to global warming, warming, et cetera, um, completely misses. The sense of the, this, the global warming um, crusade is all about looking at, at nature as a victim, okay? Somehow nature needs our, well, we've ruined nature and, that, and now and we're going to have to take steps to help nature and so on. Well, that's not the view. Na nature is enormous. Right? We, we are small, we are tiny. In the sexual persona, I talked about how we're huddling on, this, on, this, on the surface of the earth, the crust of the earth, et cetera. And it's like, and it's like 
hubris uh, to, to, to think that somehow nature is a patient on a table. Right? We, the nature will sweep us away. Okay? We'll, you know, the seas will rise. New York will be drowned. So what? Okay? That's what happened all over the world. Human settlements are drowned by the rising seas. People migrate you know, up to the mountains. You know, so on. This has been going on for thousands of years. But human beings are nothing compared to the enormity of nature. I, I think that's, that's what's missing, the cosmic perspective. If any, any true atheism, any true leftism has got to reincorporate the cosmic perspective to see how small we are in nature's plan. Right? Because we, uh, what religion gives is a sense of, the, of man's, man's frailty, of man's mortality. Uh, there, there are tremendous archetypes in all of the great religious books of the world, uh, motifs of the journey, of the dark night of the spirit. Uh, there's a sense of the, almost the magic of the elements of earth, air, fire, and water, and, and so on, uh, of, of epiphanies, of illumination, of, of, of moments when, when, when the mind sees the universe whole. All kinds of really deep, moving things are in religious literature. And we, and we do not, not necessarily have to you know, import the moralism from, from religious history uh, in order to teach these, these texts. Now, I, I certainly, as, you know, as a liberal, believe that there should no, be no theocracy, that that's one of the great achievements of the post-Enlightenment era, is that we have separated religion from the state. OK, all right, well, we must move on. Okay, now, let me give you an example. All right, all right, here, I want to talk briefly about the way that um, the biblical paradigms have informed uh, modern politics. So here, here, here is that the Negro spiritual I mentioned, Go Down Moses. Uh, here's the, here are the lyrics. Uh, when Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, African Americans were singing this in churches in the South, okay, at a time when they were enslaved. And, and, and because they used the biblical metaphor, it, it went right over the heads, okay, of the white establishment around them. But you know, listen, listen to this, okay, thus saith the Lord. Bold Moses said, let my people go. If not, I'll smite your firstborn dead. Let my people go. That is a threat of violence and revolution right, coming out of a Negro spiritual in the churches, looking for the liberated, looking for the deliverer. It's a magnificent song. Okay? Um, and, 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 and again, it shows you know, the empowering uh, nature of the Bible that should be, that should be respected. Now, when Martin Luther King um, came, came along, he used also the, uh, the metaphor of Moses and, and the promised land, not in the great I Have a Dream speech in the, uh, the March on Washington, 1963, but the day before he was assassinated, his last public statement. All right? This is the speech that's called, I See the Promised Land. This is April 3rd, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. It's available on, on the web. I just have a few excerpts from it here. Um, and, uh, it, and Martin Luther King was talking about how he's looking back through history. And this is what religion gives you, this ability to look, see back through history. And he begins, okay, um, he said, if the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt through, or rather across the Red Sea, through the wilderness on toward the promised land. And then he goes on to Greece and to Socrates and Euripides, down to the Renaissance, down to Martin Luther, his, you know, his namesake, tacking you know, the 95 theses on the door at the church in Wittenberg. And of course, that was a great moment in Western culture, a defiance of the authority of the church, which is like, you know, it's one, of the, one of the first steps in the political revolutions you know, that, that would follow. And he goes on to Abraham Lincoln, on to FDR, et cetera. And now here, he talks about how the, well, you know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite formula for doing it, right? He would he kept the slaves fighting among themselves. So, so Martin Luther King was appealing for unity in the, you know, in the civil rights movement itself. It was already talking about, uh, arguing about tactics. Should they you know, use the, uh, what Martin Luther King wished, the, the um, nonviolence of Gandhi or more radical, uh, the more radical challenges coming from the Black Panthers and, and so on. And, he, and, and then uh, he says, you know what's beautiful to me to see all these ministers of the gospel here. It's a marvelous picture. Who is it that is supposed to articulate the longings and aspirations of the people more than the preacher? 
Somehow the preacher must be an Amos and say, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And this should remind us the part that, that ministers played in the abolition movement everywhere. And also the Quakers, are very important in both England and in Philadelphia in mobilizing resistance to slavery in the United States. Right, so here's the last paragraph. Um, and uh, this is, it, it's almost as if King had a premonition of what was going to happen the next day. He goes, well, last paragraph, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. He's talking about Moses. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, look over the River Jordan, you see. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. His last public sentence, okay? And you see the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which reminds us of the Civil War, which reminds us of the assassination of Lincoln. And so somehow, how did he know something? Okay, he was going to have the very next day, he was dead. Okay. Now this shows you, again, the, the, the power of, you know, the, of the, the religious metaphor right, and the way it has affected you know, politics. Now let me move on to the history of, of Hollywood here um, and talk to you about the, the intersection between morality and the entertainment industry. Okay. Now, the, um, with, with, the, 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 there's a very interesting book by Neil Gobbler called An Empire of Their Own. Wonderful book, which I recommend. And it talks about how the Jews created Hollywood. Okay? Uh, and it, uh, all of the moguls, except for Daryl Zanuck, uh, you know, of, early, of the studio era Hollywood, were Jewish. Okay? Many of them were, you know, were poor immigrants. They had worked in the, in the garment trade. They had worked in you know, penny arcades, all kinds of things. When they got into movies, it was, just, it was, just, it was something new. No one, no one thought it was an art form. I mean, it was, it was under a cloud for a decade, which, which is why Hollywood invented you know, the, uh, the Oscars, the Academy Awards, and you'd all dress up and give each other awards for you know, art to try to establish movies as, as something serious. Alfred Hitchcock himself complained in, you know, in, the, in the 1920s, the intellectuals of, of, in England were extremely dismissive you know, of, of movies. But, it, uh, but movies were, were considered trash. Okay? It, it, it took a very long time in America for them to be taken seriously. Now, in, in, in Europe, it's a little bit different. You have artists, serious artists uh, without big budgets, without, the, you know, without uh, the hope of big audiences making art films on their own. It's a, it's a completely different kind of, a, of, a, of an ethic and aesthetic in, in, in European history. But um, Hollywood uh, was geared from the start to entertainment, to, uh, to the commercial enterprise, to, um, to, to make you know, as much as possible. It was just it was another way, way, way to make money. And so there, there's a, there is a definite the way that Hollywood was responding to what the audience wanted. But the, er, the first decades of the 20th century, uh, it was an enormous cultural transition going on. The, the World War I, then called the Great War, okay, I'm not realizing another war was coming, um, it was a tremendous blow to, to Western culture. Four years and millions of young men died in, you know, in, in the armies, uh, dragging on a stalemate. And for what? To redraw, you know, a few border lines. So, following that war, there was a great period of, of cynicism, anti-authority feelings were in the air. The young generation rebelled against the the father figures who they had dragged, you know, the young men in, into that war. So, you got this, um, you know, from after the, the late, those few years, just after the um, the uh, World War in the second decade, and then. 1920s, okay, the Jazz Age. Okay, you had this rebellion that, by the youth, was very parallel to what would happen in the 1960s. And the the, the infant movie industry was actually a, a part of this and became stereotyped as a kind of vehicle of corruption of the young. There was a lot of lament about about you know the, the terrible effects that movies are you know, having on, on particularly on small communities. 
because there was a disjunction between the sophistication of an, of an urban environment and you know and the small communities that were very had been very insular people didn't move out of them had been there for generations and you'd have in the movie theater suddenly suddenly these images coming from Hollywood that were in many cases sexually explicit or violent or uh, question religious values and so on so the, so the demands to control Hollywood started coming out very very early from it was a, a kind of um, consolidation of groups there was there were religious groups but also women's groups actually and this is something that you know, the feminism has tried, kind of tried to erase that mothers okay had these had these associations and felt that um, movies coming into small towns across America were perverse the young and, and causing everybody you know, to, to go to hell. So, the, so the, the, the pressures were so intense for reform of Hollywood that uh, Hollywood feared uh, the federal regulation. And in 1922, they brought in a politician, Will Hayes, who had been a former postmaster in the Harding uh, administration, um, and hoping that he would be you know, a kind of figurehead to, just to stave off action by, by Washington to control you know, the film industry. Now, he was like a, basically a nice guy and did nothing. Okay? So the 1920s you know, kept on going. You know, with, with, uh, there was an awful lot of pushing of, of limits. Um, and then the, the groups um, opposing Hollywood began to get more and more militant. Finally, by the early 1930s, okay, you, you, you got the Catholic Church became involved. Okay, you had the, uh, the National Conference of Bishops uh, began, got together and demanded action uh, and was threatening a boycott of Hollywood product if, you know, if there wasn't, it wasn't action. And they actually fi finally, finally did it. But in, the, the, in 1930, a production code was, a, was a adopted but still not enforced okay, for, for four more years. There was still a lot of like, sex and all kinds of you know, stuff happening in that so-called pre-code Hollywood okay, period. And it's still you know, early 1930s. And then finally the Legion of Decency was formed. And so this was at first, it was a, the Catholic Legion of Decency in 1933. And then by 1934 it became the National League of Decency with, with, with other, you know, people, other, other religions as part of it. And, and now Hollywood had to respond. And so it appointed a, a Catholic, an Irish Catholic, a Joe Joseph Ignatius Breen, all right, to enforce the Hayes Code. Okay, so the Breen office. Now this is the period where, uh, where every, you know, he just ruled. This guy knew nothing about the arts, nothing about anything, and he ruled with iron hand. And so a lot of this, you know, the stupidities and the, where people had their scripts doctored and all kind of you know, eviscerated and so on happened under Breen, you know, from 1934 on. But listen, Hollywood was pushing the limits. You know, they say that Mae West, you know, single-handedly brought on the code. I mean, she wrote her own dialogue, and boy, could that woman, you know, put more sexual in in a, in a line, you know, I mean, his famous lines like, is that a pistol in your pocket? Or are you just glad to see me? Okay, well, you know, all right, so, <laughs> and, and there, was a, there was a lot of overt nudity going on, okay, Claudette Colbert's Cleopatra bobbing nude in her milk bath and all kinds of things that are quite delicious, you know, to us, but that um, were, were viewed, again, as, you know, intrusions into into small communities. All right, now we must have, okay, I'm going to talk to you about the history of the Bible movies themselves leading into our selection from the, you know, selections from the great 1956 film, you know, the, the Ten Commandments. So there, there are two great periods of Bible movies in Hollywood, and there was a silent film era, and then these films kind of petered off yeah, by, by the early 1930s. And then, and then but the really big period that we all you know, uh, remember is following World War II. It's really from 1949 on, the 50s and early 60s, that those great Bible movies were, were, were thriving. And, and, and they really were involved in some way with the political climate of the time, of the Cold War, of America having been you know, uh, so triumphal after World War II uh, and so on. So to begin at the, the, the start, and, okay, 1903. Okay, silent film era. The movies have barely begun. The movies have just been around for like 10 years at this point. Passion play, it's called. It's the life of Christ in 31 shorts. Lasts just 61 minutes. 31 little shorts from, from the life of Christ. At 1912, Adam and Eve. Okay. 1914, Joseph in the land of Egypt. Here's the next one. Now here's a big, a big one. D.W. Griffiths, right, uh, stung by the backlash against his racist *The Birth of Nation*, you know, the, uh, *The Birth of a Nation* in uh, 1915, produced this gigantic thing which bankrupted him, and it's just a, a, it was a disaster, and still is like, you know, you can't believe it's just so bad in so many ways. But it's like 1916, *Intolerance*. It takes, it, he's inter, he interweaves four different periods: the modern. 
Renaissance okay, and Judea with the crucifixion of Christ, and then Babylon, not, not the story of the Jews in Babylon, but the story of two, two, uh, two kings you know, warring with each other and so on. Now this is the first of the really great, uh, uh, what Cecil B. DeMille would be famous for. Okay? For, for intolerance, Griffith uh, had hired 16,000 extras okay? and built, built sets. Some of them were like 300 feet tall. Okay? So we're getting this like cast of thousands kind of idea of the biblical epic you know, with that. And there's a sense now movies are discovering what they have, which is quite different than what you can do on the stage, right? Which is spectacle, okay? Pure spectacle, okay? You know, just for its own sake, like huge numbers of animals and horses galloping, and you know, and, and like new girls, and, you know, dancing, and you know, all, all that stuff. Right. Okay. Um, so now, the next next step would be the Chosen Prince, 1917, David and Jonathan. Uh, and now The Queen of Sheba, a completely forgotten movie in 1921. I think could, could even be one of these lost films. A lot, a lot of these films are lost. They've, they've degenerated. Uh, you, you know, try, we're trying to sort of reconstruct early Hollywood history. This starred Betty Blythe. Now, I happen to have a, a slide of that in our University of the Arts collection. It is amazing. It's, as The Queen of Sheba, Betty Blythe is sitting there in this like netting, okay, laden with jewels and so on. And she's com her breasts are absolutely totally visible through the netting. So she's just kind of like sitting there. So you see how a Bible story is becoming a vehicle to like just basically show sex. Okay, if you like just have a Bible topic, you can show as much sex as you want. It's like it's like legit. You know, saying I mean, it's a, it's fun and, and and so it's understand. It's not just prudery. Okay, that made people uh, you know object to Hollywood movies. It really was that Hollywood was pushing things toward you know the pornographic because it, it's what sold. People turned out in droves. Anything even vaguely pornographic, I mean, it brings people out. You know, um, to, to see beautiful women nude. And people, I mean, seems both men and women. And seem to want to see that. Now, 1923, the Cecil B. DeMille's first version of the Ten Commandments as a silence. He did it, he did it twice, okay, 1923. Uh, and in this version, it's, um, he, Moses is old. I mean, you begin with Moses old and white bearded and so on, and, it's, and, the, and the story starts when there already have been nine plagues, and, and, and we're about to have the, you know, the plague of the, the firstborn um, son you know, killed, etc. So what, what the 1956 film adds to it is sex appeal. You have a young you know, Moses, played by Charlton Heston, who then ages in the process of the film, and it's really, it's really quite magnificent, uh, this, tra this, this transition from uh, the young Egyptian prince, okay, Sexy, you know, charismatic, you know, flirting with women, into this obsessed, you know, prophet, you know, with a beard, with his eyes focused only on God, and so on. It's, I think it's, I think it's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal performance, and it's never gotten in, in, enough credit. But in, but in the Ten Commandments, 1923, you already see the orgies. Okay, Cecil B. DeMille loved the orgies. I mean, he would talk moralism, but we get this like the golden calf episode is an opportunity. I mean, the Bible doesn't have. I mean, yes, there's like revelry. You hear about this, there's dancing, there's uncleanness. But I mean, whoa, does that scene expand, okay? <laughs> so, and, and, and in the 1923 version, I mean, you really, you, you want to like keep stopping it. Whoa, wait, what's, what's going on there? What's going on there? And so on. But by 1956, you know, you couldn't get it because the production code was still operative. The 1956 version, it's basically people just chasing each other and like, and swinging on ropes and like, and there's like kind of a lot of writhing around to like, to like imply an orgy, but you know, and so on. And, and there's a lot of like, I mean, how like a kind of panting at it toward the, toward the golden calf, or is it implying bestiality? And animality and so on. All right, so 1956, this is the big one, okay, we're getting to, um, which runs like three and a half hours and, um, you know, and has, it's, it, and it's like this, it's, 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 there's many, many invented scenes trying to fill out the whole, you know, life, life of Moses. Um, and then, we'll, so we'll, we'll get to that shortly, but following that is um, Solomon and Sheba, 1959, King v Vidor with Yul Brynner and Gina Lola Brigida, Ben Hur, 1959. Uh, and then Spartacus is not really, you know, it's not, it's not about the Bible, but it's like part of the, you know, part of the epic films of, of that period. A very interesting fi film uh, by Stanley Kubrick, directed by Stanley Kubrick, uh, with Kirk Douglas in Phenomenal. It's, of course, it's a political theme. It's about a slave rebellion, 71 BC, and it's all about human rights and liberties and, and so on. Uh, and it was written by uh, Howard Fast, who was one of the blacklisted writers uh, who, um, who started this novel when he was actually in, in prison. He had been a member of the Communist Party, um, and you're getting this sense of Rome. You see, and it, you see it also in the Ten Commandments. The sense of Rome uh, or Egypt, okay, being presented as um, equivalents to Hitler's Germany or Stalin's you know, Russia you know, of that period. So there's a definite political 
um, message in a lot of these movies where the United States is identified with, with God's law in some way. It's, it's, the, it's, the, you know, it's the land, the promised land in some way that, was, that is the ultimate land of liberty, living under God, and, you know, et cetera. All right, so then moving on, we've got the King of Kings, 1961. By the early 1960s, they start weakening, okay? It's, it's already weakening. Jeffrey Hunter, as Jesus, was criticized for being too white, you know, white, too Nordic, you know, uh, for, um, for, you know, a bronzed, you know, um, uh, member of the, uh, uh, product of the, of the Near East and so on. Barabbas, 1961, the story of uh, the Pontius Pilate, Barabbas, you know, being released to, to the to people, Anthony Quinn and Silvano Magnano. Uh, Robert Aldrich, kind of a misfire with Sodom and Gomorrah. Then you've got um, the greatest story ever told, 1963. Again, why do they keep going to the Nordic actors? Max, Max von Sydow from the Ingmar Bergman films, okay, is like cast as Jesus in, with his Swedish accent. It just makes, it makes very little sense. Then we get to the Bible and we're way over, and this is John Huston's Vanity Project, 1966, with John Huston playing the part of Noah and these, these like obnoxious voiceovers imitating Cecil B. DeMille's voiceovers, but not working nearly as well. Probably Probably the best things in it are like Ava Gardner and George C. Scott as uh, Sarah and Abraham, uh, but also Peter O'Toole, fabulous as um, the angel who comes to Sodom. I mean, he's like so, he's like so mysterious and sexy and fabulous, ghost, kind of ghostly. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful little episode there. Then we get now, now we're getting it's the end of those epics, and we're getting into the period of irony, right? So you, you or of you know of of reinterpretation. You're getting. Uh, for example, the Jesus Christ Superstar, which is, the, which is the 1973 film based on the rock opera by Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd uh, Webber, and it's based on the Gospels, but you get this like antagonism between Jesus and Judas Iscariot, and there's no resurrection in it, which is why it's on the you know, hate list of a lot of like, Christian groups you know, because of that, directed by Norm, Norman Jewison, right? Then you, uh, we, we, we must mention 1979, it's not a Hollywood film, okay, but Life of Brian, Monty Python's parody, which is, a, 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 which is on YouTube. A lot of it's on YouTube in segments. I really recommend it. Um, it's quite hilarious. Like you know, when Jesus is doing the on the Sermon on the Mount, and the camera pulls back to the people standing in the rear, and they're kind of, you know, of course, Jesus is talking about peace and love, and they're like quarreling with each other and so on, and they, they can't quite hear. And they went, "What did he say?" What did he? And so the line, you know, "Blessed are the peacemakers." They hear. What blessed are the cheesemakers? You know, so it's, like, it's, 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 it's quite quite wonderful. But you see how it's already like irony is like substituted now for religious belief. And then then we have the period, just like a few more of, of the of the great controversies. Okay, over now biblical films. Um, you have Martin Scorsese's 1988 film, The Last Temptation of Christ, William Dafoe, okay, based on a, on a 1960 novel by Nikos Kazantzakis, uh, where uh, the whole thing is a hallucination of Jesus on the cross, and you've got Barbara Hershey, you know, as, as Mary Magdalene, they have sex, but it's all like a dream of, of Jesus on the cross. Well, there was a huge outcry against that, all right? And also, and these, again, this is not a... Um, and, you know, and it fed into what was going on in the late 80s, which was the scandals over like Andre Serrano's uh, photograph, you know, Piss Christ and so on, where you had like a crucifix submerged in the artist's urine and, you know, and so on. Uh, it was like a huge uh, thing on the, on the floor of the you know, US Congress and the cutting off of funds to the National Endowment for the Arts and, and so on. It was, so, so that film got all, all involved in it. And another film that came from, from France at the time, Jean, Jean-Luc uh, Godard's Hail Mary, 1985, also created a scandal. It's, it's a modernization of the virgin birth, which is like a teenager who finds herself pregnant and, and, and so on and so forth. All right, um, so, all right, so that's just like the, oh, oh, I should mention The Passion of the Christ from 2004, Mel Gibson's film, coming from a completely different angle as a believer, um, a film which, of course, he co-wrote, he co-produced, he and directed, um, and it's based on the New Testament, the final hours of, of Jesus, the dialogue is in Aramaic, Latin, and Hebrew with, uh, with subtitles and so on, and it remains the highest gross by the way, non-English language film, you know, ever. But there was a tremendous uh, controversy over it because of the overt anti-Semitism, you know, in it, and the graphic violence that was. Um, that, but nevertheless, you know, very religious uh, people, have, you know, have, have loved that film. All right, now let us move to okay the uh, 1956 Ten Commandments, and I want you to see the prologue, which has been removed from from television versions of this. All right, now I'd like to go to number two. This is Cecil B. DeMille himself coming out okay, from behind a curtain, which is interesting in terms of what happens later, uh, and addressing, the, um, addressing us. Ladies and gentlemen, young and old, this may seem an unusual procedure, speaking to you before the picture begins, but we have an unusual subject, the story of the birth of freedom, the story of Moses. As many of you know, 
The Holy Bible omits some 30 years of Moses' life. From the time he was a three-month-old baby and was found in the bulrushes by, by Bethia, the daughter of Pharaoh, and adopted into the court of Egypt until he learned that he was Hebrew and killed the Egyptian. To fill in those missing years, we turn to ancient historians such as Philo and Josephus. Philo wrote at the time that Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth, and Josephus wrote some 50 years later and watched the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. These historians had access to documents long since destroyed or perhaps lost, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. The theme of this picture is whether men are to be ruled by God's law or whether they are to be ruled by the whims of a dictator like Ramesses. Are men the property of the state or are they free souls under God? This now, you notice how the way he's clutching that microphone, it's, it's, it's like Moses with his rod, you know, later on. And then and the curtain, you'll see there's a scene with a curtain later on. So he's like, so little, it, it's strange. He identifies himself both with Moses and with Pharaoh. But you heard the reference to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, hardly 10 years, okay, it was known, known to the world at that point. And the political theme that, that you know, overt now, uh, is, where uh, DeMille is saying, in effect, that Pharaoh and Egypt represent um, communism, all right, and, uh, and, you know, and, and people under communism are, are or property of the state, and only in the in the United States, in some way, is the the vision of liberty that is um, you know that is recorded in the uh, Old Testament. Now, what what else? Here? Okay, so now let us move on to um, the, 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 number seven. I'd like to see. This is called Moses the Conqueror. You have Moses returning in triumph uh, from his uh, his victory in Ethiopia and received by the, by the Pharaoh Seti. The blessings of the god Amun Ra be upon you, great prince. He has brought down the pride of Ethiopia. He has set his the old the wind He has raised Egypt to its I agree with it. Welcome to my sister's son. We have heard how you took Ibis from the Nile to destroy the venomous serpents used against you when you laid siege to the city of Saba. May my arms stay strong in your service, great city. Who is this fair young god come into the house of Pharaoh? No need to tell you how I share her joy at your return. No need, my brother. Great one, I bring you Ethiopia. Command them to kneel before Pharaoh. Command what you have conquered, my brother. I bring the Ethiopian king and his sister in friendship as an ally to guard our southern gates. My son has dealt wisely with you, Ethiopia. Welcome as a friend. Great king, I will ask but one favor of your friendship. This green stone from our mountains, that I may give it to your prince of Egypt, for he is kind as well as wise. It is pleasing to the gods to see a man honored by his enemies. And such a beautiful enemy. Now, a couple of things. First of all, notice that at a time when the production code was forbidding miscegenation, right, Cecil B. DeMille was pushing it there. I mean, just to show in, an interracial flirtation was really quite daring for 1956 uh, and, and done extremely well. Um, now, notice the archetypes here. Okay? There are these archetypal themes in the Bible. And they have to do, with, for example, the, the battling brother motif between Pharaoh, uh, or, excuse me, the, the, uh, the firstborn of Pharaoh, that is played by Yul Brynner, the future Pharaoh, Ramses, and um, um, and, uh, and, and Moses, who has the archetypal um, uh, motif also of the ambiguous birth of the hero. I mean, this is like a, a, a pattern that's observed worldwide, that the uh, hero has a mysterious birth, and, 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 and uh, you know, the rumor is that you're half divine, born from the river, you know, found 
Oedipus Rex says the same thing. You know, it's like he doesn't know who his parents really are. It's so so, part, so the, the whole saga of the hero is about a, a quest for identity. That, and when Moses discovers in the process of the film that he's, that he's Hebrew, he then throws everything off and goes to search for his own people in the brick pits of Goshen and so on. That's where he ends up slaying the overseer. It's really, it's, I think it's extremely well done in, in this film. So can, let's go to number eight, just for a little brief moment, to show the, how Cecil B. DeMille has, I think, successfully imported sec, the sex in eroticism into the story. Sorry, just, just a brief thing. N number eight, Throne Princess. You're the throne princess. And by the Pharaoh's law, you can marry only a Pharaoh. I shall marry a Pharaoh. You. Ramses might not agree wait, with that idea. But said he might. I wait, we missed, wait, we, we, did, had, did we miss the first line? Or the first, can we stop? Okay, well, the first line was, your fragrance is like the wine of Babylon, he says to her. Okay, and I love that. Your fragrance. Now, this was the period when, like, men were men and women were women. Okay, back in the 1950s. Okay, you see, you see what the sexual revolution did. Like, I removed all that. I mean, who, who would say today, uh, you know, like a man to a woman, your fragrance is like the wine of Babylon. I mean, is that is that that's just that's fantastic. Okay? I mean, the, the, the heterosexuality absolutely sizzles. Okay, I mean, between between these two. All right, so this, I think it's really marvelous how um, it says the mill has done on this because it's, it's so important to show what Moses renounces okay, in order to become um, the, you know, the, the, this, uh, the prophet of, of God later on. I mean, everything, all the, the beauty and the pleasure and the power, all these things okay, are, then, um, are then renounced to, to move on to love of God and in pursuit of God's, God's mission. The light of God shines from you, Moses. Do not kneel to me, Joshua. These tablets of stone. The writing of God. His Ten Commandments. There is a noise of war in the camp. It is not the noise of war. It is the noise of song and revelry. <laughs> reflection. This is 1956. And um, notice the depiction of the, you know, the, the golden calf scene and so on, and how prophetic it is of another movie 13 years later, Woodstock. Okay. Um, how, how uh, this, oh, there's song and revelry, okay, and so on. Fa co high colored fabrics, always a no-no, and so on. Sensuality, music, and the drums playing, and so on. I mean, what, what a, a, a incredible generational shift there would be within, within, a, within a few short years. Um, so anyway, we, the, the, the hook has come, so we must uh, cease. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>